My name is Mav Turner. I'm a product manager at SolarWinds. Uh, I focus on the networking products, and uh, which is convenient for what we're talking about today. And obviously, Joel's with me. He's what's chief architect. Is that your? He's just kind of like Steven said. He's kind of one of the coolest guys in the companies because he can talk about anything, and it's actually interesting to just talk about. So, um, for those of you who aren't familiar familiar with SolarWinds, we do IT management. Um, historically, we did network management. We've branched out over the last few years. And just as a quick summary of our, our web page here, you know, log an event, storage, virtualization. So as somebody was saying earlier in the room about when you go to a web page, you just want to see um, the actual content. We try to make it very clear that we do all of these different areas. So from a marketing perspective, that's as much as I'm going to talk about what SolarWinds does. If you want me to talk about product roadmap or what we're working on in any of these products, I'm happy to. But we figured the best way to start this morning would be just to jump directly into demos of products and start kind of poking around with the new stuff that we've been working on. And uh, don't, don't hesitate to ask questions. We're happy to, to pivot the conversation in any direction that you guys are interested in taking it. But we're going to start out with talking about one of our, our, our products that uh, IPSLA manager may, may or may not know. And uh, if you're familiar with Cisco IPSLA, it should be kind of a no-brainer what this product does. Uh, it helps you configure the IPSLA operations on the routers runs a test, use SNMP to gather data about what act is actually going on with this operation. So you're using IPSLA from the router? Correct. You configure the operation on the router. We don't, we're not doing our own synthetic test for okay. it. We're just saying, hey, what did you find out when you ran that operation? You're, and, using, you're, you're reading SLA in Correct. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Yep. So gather the data, have it historical. We can alert off of it, report off of it. Obviously, all the advantages you can imagine. Instead of just being confined to the, the command line and trying to see the current statistics, you can see graphs over time. You can see details about the operation, um, some details about the node itself. Um, nothing really exciting on this one. This is actually a beta build of our current release that we're working on. So um, this, this is an interesting history, uh, and it has an interesting future. Uh, so this product was originally called VoIP. And so you see some of the VoIP stuff, because a lot of people wanted IPSLA because they wanted to evaluate the quality of their network, their WAN for voice, right? right. Again, no brainer. Um, I'm going to take you to the online demo for the current version so I can show you. Can we see more. the VoIP one? Uh, in one second, yes. yes. Um, and so it was called VoIP, it died, and, all, and it really did IPSLA. So um, we pulled, I think, three statistics from call managers. So you know, I think it was all call manager five and before. So it wasn't very exciting from a uh, call manager perspective, to be honest. Um, so let's go to the VoIP summary. World in denim. So we can get the sites, but these are just the call paths that you've set up before. We've got some basic information about phones registered and gateways registered. But that was pretty much all we did for from a voice, from a telephony perspective. Um, obviously, the, the IPSLA aspect of it is, has a huge amount of value. You can really quickly see relative metrics, right? But from gathering information about your voice environment, CDR records, which is kind of redundant, that's what the R stands for, um, CDR details, looking at um, more detailed breakdown of what actually happened on this specific call when something went wrong. So that's we've had a lot of requests for that over time, and so that's what we're actually working on now. So it was called voice. We changed it to IP IPSLA manager. And now we're going to go more focused back on the overall network quality and, and voice solutions part of the product. So instead of just getting deeper on IPSLA Manager, um, we're going to actually broaden it back out to more of the voice use cases. So let me see. So all of our products, well, it's not, all of our Orion platform products run on Windows. So you install it, runs on Windows, Microsoft SQL on the back end. And then some of our newer products, we actually use um, virtual appliances. So I'll talk about some of those later. So those usually run some Linux distribution on the back end. And, but usually you don't have to worry about it because you drop in the, the virtual appliance and you don't have to worry about the details. So this, let me show you something real quick. Can you schedule new SLAs from your interface or do I have to go to the router and schedule it? You can do it directly through our product. And I'll, I'll walk you through it real quick because that's actually one of the, the cool things about this. Most of you are technical enough. You can go configure your operation. It's fine. But a lot of these we found were having problems. They weren't using IPSLA because it was just too hard to, to set up. And Cisco kept changing the, the configuration syntax. And so nobody really knew how to. Last for me. Yeah. So um, we just have a simple menu that drives you through. And you, know, you can select several different operations. 
We have support for most of the operations that IPSLA supports, but not all of them. So um, Metro Ethernet is probably the, the operation we get requested the most that we don't currently have support for. Um, but, you know, just a simple UDP echo operation. By the way, can you figure out which ones work on the particular iOS release? That like which one's supported by that? No. It's, it'll go through, and I believe what will happen if you do that is the, the SMP set that we do to configure the operation will fail. And so, you know, that's how you find out it doesn't work. I'm curious, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm curious what do you mean by metro internet operation that gets requested the most? So there's a there's an operation that gives you more detailed statistics about those. Oh, metro the Ethernet Ethernet. thing. Yeah, or? right. Yeah. Okay. So it's a specific operation type supported by iOS that you can run. So, um, but these are the operation types that we do support. Most people can get by with a TCP connect because you can say that that technically covers any application you want to monitor. I'll just you know the port it needs to use and, and test that. The operation will run from your source router, hit your destination on schedule maybe every five minutes by default. Can you do more than just the connect? Can you actually run, uh, can you like log into it? Say no. radius or no, how that serves yeah. Yes, so we have another product that, oh, <laughs> and this is something that I mentioned earlier that we actually have so many products. Um, sometimes it's hard for our users to understand, you know, where to go for which product. Um, really the best way we like to talk about it is what's your problem and then here's your solution to that specific what, what, what about people who, or companies who don't really understand what their problem is? They may think what their problem is, but they're not aware of the problem. Right. So that's why, putting on my sales hat, we have a free 30-day evaluation of all of our products, right? So we encourage users to download it, install it, try it, and if it's not providing the value that you need, then talk to your, the sales guy. The sales guy will say, oh, okay, I understand. This is what you actually need. Try this. Um, but most if you're not getting to the right place, then our marketing is not directing you there, right? The, the idea is that when you go to Google, when you go to read blog posts from guys like you, um, you hear about this product that meets this general set of requirements you think you have. But, but that's, there's no way to kind of get around the fact that if somebody says, I think I need X and I want Y, and you can't connect them, you know? So. Uh, uh, I don't know where Marco has this in mind, but I'll expand on what he asked. Okay. Most people don't know what problem they have. Yeah. And so, yes, you can schedule SLA measurements, you can schedule this and that and that and that. And so, yes, they will discover that TCP works slowly. Now, what? Yeah. What? So, so that's the, the interesting thing, right? Like, that's the... Once you have all this data, so even, even say you know that you need that data, mm -hmm. you still have the same question of, okay, yes, this operation has 30 milliseconds latency. Yeah, so Is that good? I Is that bad? I myself that I have a problem. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Now what? <laughs> yeah. But, but even then, there, there's, there's two questions. One, okay, yes, there's absolutely a bad, a bad thing going on. I have high latency. I have high jitter. There's something going on across this connection. Or is that bad? Does it matter if I have 50 millisecond latency across some link? Does that actually impact an application or a user that's going across it? Maybe, maybe not. Do you right? set thresholds? Right, so you can set thresholds. But again, that, that, imp that implies that you understand what your baseline should be and then where you should go from there. And then the actual troubleshooting of, okay, I've got, I, want, I want to decrease this 50 millisecond. My, my threshold's constantly being hit because I'm a good network administrator. I know what my, my SLA should be for my users. And I need to get this uh, latency down to 10, 10 milliseconds across this link. So you're saying okay, can I expand now on Ivan's question? Well, I was, was going to. This was a better idea. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you're a good student. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have two more back and forth. What, uh, uh, I, I believe, but believe what, what Ivan was trying to say is okay, we now know there's something right. happening right. in our network. Now what? Right. That's what, what do you do about it? That's exactly what I was about to say. So, so, like, so I've got my, my threshold, I've hit that, now I'm at my 20 millisecond. So, how do I solve the actual problem? Yep. Yes. And, and so, it depends on what your problem is, right? Um, so you don't have a magic product that automatically troubleshoots everything in your network and says, this has a high application load because there is a, um, this application was going, like there's nightly backup, right? And all this traffic's going across, so your day latency is fine, but at night, your latency spikes up. Okay, well you can use NetFlow, which I assume you're familiar with NetFlow. We have a NetFlow product to say, okay, what's going on? So you need to drill in, you need to start somewhere. So starting somewhere is having that data, which most people don't have today, to say between, 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. I have really high latency across this link. Okay, now I go to NetFlow. What's going on in this at this time? Okay, there's just nightly backup. Okay, well we still have users that are working from 8 to 10 p.m. Let's push that to 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. And so, 
you know, I, I'm not trying to avoid your question by saying it depends, but, no, no, you know, no, just no, like no. you guys know, when you're troubleshooting a problem, you need to start somewhere and then kind of... So you're saying basically that you're, you've broken out a lot of these, the, your, your attack scenario is to have, be modular, whereas some right. of your competitors would give you a whole suite. Yes. And you're saying you would use a different component, and you're, you're saying it's your responsibility with the, your customer to make sure that the right components are purchased. Right. The, the, our goal is to be able to provide at a very low cost, low, low entry price, easy to use solution for your specific problem. I have this problem, okay? Here's your solution. Some customers do say, literally, give me a quote for everything you've got. Just give it all to me. I don't want to worry about the details. I have extra budget. I need to just, just give me a quote for everything. But in general, the reason that we draw the cart exactly, and some people get frustrated by that because they feel like it's being nickel and dimed, and they would rather see one large number for everything. Right. But our approach right. is no, like we want to be able to have those people who have, who know they have a specific problem to get that specific solution, move on, and and again, if you do just want to buy everything and never use half of it, we'll sell it what to you. Um, <laughs> what about uh, we have a tool that does something similar, um, configures IPSLA. Uh, probes with uh, SNMP, and we've had issues where um, it's so many hack configures that it impacted the router. So it, do you have a, some sort of mechanism for managing that? No, so we don't do any sort of analysis. Like, ideally, if you wanted to have a kind of ideal vision of how you would do this, is you would have baseline metrics of the performance of the device over time, and then you would add, a, <coughs> add an operation, and then say, OK, the impact is this, and we could, you know, count up to say, okay, if I add 100 more operations, what's the theoretical impact? We, we, don't, we don't get to that level. We, we kind of rely on you to monitor your device and say, you know what, CPU load is high for some reason, and, and I know it wasn't high until I installed this. Uh, I, uh, I haven't run into that too many times. Can you add something like a sanity check in there? Absolutely. When you, you start a new SLA, you could say, excuse me, this device is already at 60% CPU load for the last three hours. Absolutely. Maybe, just maybe, you don't want to do that. Right. And, yeah. and that the way the IPSLA major works today mm -hmm. is it, it requires NPM, which is our, you know, kind of just main product that says... Yeah, I was going to say, couldn't you, you would monitor the... So you monitor the, the node anyway. The CPU yeah. utilization, get it with, a, with NPM. Right. So, yeah. so that's no, a no, manual uh, process you could do that. And to answer your question, yes, we could, you, we could go back and say, hey, what's this, before we do more of this node, let's check to see if it's already at 88% utilization on memory or CPU, and just throw a warning up and say, before you do this, you might want to consider the impact. We exactly. could do that. Honestly, it's not come up. And so okay. we... We, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure yeah. there are use cases where yeah, it makes I sense. remember that during the design of, of some of those features, we actually brought up that scenario that we should actually detect that. Mm -hmm. And we are so kind of feedback driven in terms of what goes in the release that, you know, until it reaches a certain threshold from support, <coughs> that we have, you know, so many customers that are reporting that problem, mm -hmm. it's usually not bubbling up to the top of the priority list. And, so, and that's why yeah. it's not right. being, but we, we are aware of those type of issues and, you know, Ideally, I'd like to build a product from the get where we have all the stuff, you know, kind of all those edge cases kind of worked out. But that's one of the difference with SolarWinds and the other kind of, you know, enterprise software companies that we tend to build really kind of what makes sense for the customers and, and what they are asking us to do right now. Well, how, so I'm wondering, like a, HP and some, uh, Opnet and all CAA. of this, you, yeah. you got to buy, you got to buy the consulting services. You got to yeah. buy the yes. PS yes. when you buy the product. There's none of that for us. No. We, don't don't have, we don't have services at all. You don't have a PS no. division? No. no, we don't. So you're convinced that out of the box? Yep. Yes. I've been with that company for five years now, okay. and we have not needed it. It is that way. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I was actually going to say, if, if somebody wanted to like start downloading it now on a VM, by the time we were done talking, you'd be up and monitoring. Like, it's a next, next process for most users. The whole point is kind of what you we were saying earlier. We don't want you to have to, to really know a lot. And it's, and it's unfortunately kind of sad sometimes the and a lot of it's not the guy's fault because they have to do a hundred different things. And so, but the level of networking knowledge that we see out there is, and the responsibility that some of the people have is, you know, could be better. <laughs> and so it's, we see it often where somebody doesn't even know basics about IP and they're, they're the network administrator. But sometimes those guys are also the server and the virtualization. Right. And so, you know, I, I completely understand. I've been in that situation many how, years ago. How good is your support? How good is your support staff? I mean, is it, a lot of times you get level one and it's just, 
you know, just escalate me to level two. I mean, in helping with problems like this, yeah. like, you'd see yeah, it. No, so there, there's aspects. There's the one, there's the customization aspect of right. something like we've said, like, hey, I've added these operations, now there's impact. And that requires a lot more um, understanding of the network. But a lot of the guys that we hire are former network administrator and server administrators. So they've been in that situation. They understand it. Um, you know, just like everybody else, they're pretty overloaded. A lot of the guys would love to spend all day on a single call talking to you, but that's not, you know, that's not a realistic at this phase. But there's a lot of good feedback. Um, we get some people we have get a pretty to good retention in terms of people <coughs> renewing their maintenance. And usually that's the, the threshold that you look at for people who are happy with support, basically. Because we have a fair share amount of, of support goals, you know. Uh, given the number of units that we sell each quarter, it generates a huge amount of load for us, even just question about how to's. Yeah. And so if we are not good at that, then most of those people will actually not renew their maintenance when it comes time to actually renew it. And so um, overall, we, we, we have a pretty good you know, feedback from there. And, and, and as Matt said, yeah, we, we have experienced guys on, on the field basically that are answering the question, even for level one. So. They're not just triaging saying, have you, have you done step one? Have you done step two? Have you done step three? Have you really done the yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Reboot the gateway. Yeah. Uh, uh, another question. Yeah. So when, you're, when the IP SLA triggers an alert, so we are above a certain threshold. Yes. Could you take a snapshot of the path the packets are taking at that time? So I'm glad that I put that question with you earlier because, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, seriously. Uh, so historically, we did not have support for what are called path operations. Yes. And um, we had them, and I believe the last release, I'm trying to remember if it's, which, I think it's a TCP, one of the path operations. Uh, so this is the operation type. So if the operation type supports path operations, then we can actually get that full path. I'm trying to remember which, there's, there's two operation types. So no, like even if the operation doesn't support it, couldn't you at that moment schedule a ping or transfer? We could or do it. and yeah. collect that because you no, know, it's totally useless if you show me that something has been about the threshold and I have no idea <coughs> where to start troubleshooting. Right, like what are the ten different if pops. If the is event that? is gone by the time, uh, silver up. Yep. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, uh, and, and real quick. Um, uh, just, just as kind of a, a meta conversation, we can talk about, like, uh, we enjoy these types of conversations, I think. Like, we can talk about what we can do and the interesting things to do. And for us, it's really great feedback for, to hear that. But if that's what we want to talk about, like, or we can talk about what we actually do. Up okay. to you guys. Just yeah, tell us. I mean, we'll go whichever direction. So what do you do now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. but I, I do have a question that remains still unanswered. Okay. Uh, that, that I did ask 10 minutes ago. And that is, okay, uh, we found that there is a problem. And you explain how you can use your other products to uh, further troubleshoot what's the problem. And fair enough, I'm going to go back. We found the problem. Now what? How do you fix what? it? How do you fix it? Yeah. Do, you, uh, do you have any sort of automation built into this tool that actually provides uh, assistance of how to address the problem that we are experiencing? Because just seeing that there's a problem is the equivalent <laughs> of having a general car fault right. in your car. Yeah. It doesn't really help. There's you a red light. The okay. mechanic. Yeah. Um, so do you want, can I answer this question? Okay, answer this question. I'll come back to you. Um, so, so, yes, somewhat. So NCM, which is our configuration manager product, has some scripting ability into it. So you can actually say, go run this script, check for this condition, do this action. And so, so, so it can be triggered actually by this tool, you can trigger a certain pre An NCM config change template can be used so in, in so some cases. Hey, but, so are you saying that I could trigger on a threshold uh, for example, if the latency is too high, you could log into the router and bring up another interface. So oh, yeah, that would take a lot of, not a lot, but it would take some customization. And uh -huh. it's not like if you down, again, the, the way we build our products is so that out of the box, the primary use cases provide value. Um, when you start to get automated change changes, it's, things start to get a little scary, right? Because you can automatically shut down your network and do things you can't get back. So. I would say the power is there to do that, but it's not something that, you know, that we've done necessarily specifically before. And um, I don't know, Joel, if you have any other comments on on. No, I the, think the, the basic building blocks are there. So you know, okay. there's there, there's a way for you to do some action in NCM from an alert. Okay. No, whatever you do in that script is up yeah, to you. Sure. And so you give me all the rope I need to hang myself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> no. I, I just have to go down this. Well, I know that Tommy is waiting to ask a question. But <laughs> we'll come back. We'll come back to you. No, no. But 
Uh, Obviously, we're talking about uh, about Cisco products here, and the focus is on Cisco. But Cisco does have these days in iOS something that has all this functionality and has all the features in place to actually recover when there is a problem. And it's called the performance routing or optimized edge routing. Uh, so how do you position yourself to say that, okay, your product, other than being click, 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 uh, is better or the people should be using this product instead of what's there in iOS and which utilizes the same things and can actually work around the yeah, problem? So I would say, again, since that's not the main focus of the product, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily see those as in, in conflict. So yes, you could use optimized edge routing to solve some of these problems, but we're not saying that the primary value of NCM is in this optimization. And at the end of the day, most customers are going to be using multiple tools, right? We're, we have plenty of solutions. We want you to use as much of our product as possible, but we focus on specific use cases. And honestly, that's probably a level of technicality and complexity that is not really what our products are designed to solve. Um, they're interesting problems, but Fair enough. yeah. Well, here's a question. So are wait, you wait, saying? We, oh, you he's been <laughs> Mine's more of a comment, Sue. So you go on this thread. So, are you saying that most of your customers are the small to medium enterprise? Is that fair? Or yes. So okay. yeah, we, we definitely that's that's the sweet spot, the sweet spot for our offering. Okay. We target for the SMB. No, we have a lot of large enterprise and, and yeah. department in large enterprise that actually use our software. Because what happens is most of the time you'll have a company that you know standardized on OpenView, for instance, or standardized in the past on OpenView. And but you've got work groups who don't like OpenView and then they start using Orion and like NPM. And and basically what happens is that we start kind of a viral effect basically that the, then the other work group starts to do that and, and then that's how we displace most of the time those big frameworks out of those companies, is because People that actually are in the trenches see the value that the product has and like using our products day in, day out, and then they get the bill at the end of the year and they see that basically they can basically buy you know, additional licenses for the, other, uh, you know, for the other departments for a fraction of the price that it would cost them to win, renew the maintenance on, on the big framework. And so, you know, that's what, and that's how our marketing efforts are targeted at is, is really what people do we solve? And that's how people get to us. And sure, you know, there's a lot of automation that can be done and things like that. The problem when you're looking at that is that applies to maybe the top 10% of all the companies that are yeah. out there. Yeah. Sure, yeah. all the Fortune 2000 or 1000 will probably need that. But for us, that's, that's a subset of the market that we are targeting. Yeah, I, I think sure. the, the gap is between the big, large uh, organization and the small guys who use the open yeah. source. And, 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 uh, and eventually we are eventually we are driven there, mm -hmm. but it's very slow compared yeah. to you know, we will not jump ahead of what our customer base is asking us to actually do there, and that that's why you see a, a kind of a, a different approach from most of the other software companies, you know, in network management in that aspect, you know. And, so and you're not feature driven, you're customer driven. We are not technology driven technology in the driven. sense of typical engineering company where you know they'll push technology on the edge. You know, and build it until we have a critical mass of customers that are asking for those type of problems. It's, it's about the commoditization of IT, right? This is a known problem. It's not new. We've been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years. And so we're going to solve that well-known problem. And that way we don't have to educate you on this new marketing concept that somebody in a room came up with. And you're like, what is this thing? You know, it's, that's the classic enterprise software model. That's, we're not interested in that. And that's why when we were talking earlier about being use case driven and I have this problem with the solution you have works because we're not trying to sell you something you don't need. We're trying to say, we have this product that solves this problem. And you're like, yes, I have this well-known problem. Thank you. I'll take the solution. Uh, I have uh, one last question about IPSLA. Yes. Um, do you uh, IPSLA is VRF aware? Yes. VRF. Um, do you support VRF configuration? Yes, we do. So, uh, Thank let you. Me, let me <laughs> is that, so real quick on this, uh, let me just walk through the rest of this wizard real quick, and maybe that'll also help too. So when you configure your operation, you can set more details about how the path of that operation is actually configured. So obviously the simple just being the source and destination, but you can set multiple hops and other customizations. But on the, uh, the next page, I believe, is where you can actually set the VRF. So the, the one thing I will say is this is one of the few areas in our product that actually does support VRF. We've had more requests for supporting VRF with status and SNP getting, um, that's great. oh, I'm not really doing a good job of walking through what I'm doing here, but again, the whole point being 
It's very easy to use mini driven. I select my operation type, my path, my source node. That source node has to be managed by NPM right now. I select the node and I can say if I want the path to be bi-directional um, or if I just want to try it from one way. Um, and if I want to specify an external node. So if I'm using the um, UDP echo operation um, and I want to create a operation to you know solarwinds.com and you know some people could say that yeah you set these operations up against external host and you don't have to technically own that right we're not validating that you own solarwinds.com but you know that's another yeah thing or um, so anyway see complete this operation we we'll go out there it'll ping it every couple of minutes and here's your web page oh. on the online demo. <laughs> Oh, I think that's blocked from the. So. Oh, it's in the. Oh no, no, no! This is actually my internal one. Why is this? You did say it was very social. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, in the meantime, Michelle, to answer your question about the market, uh, I once been visiting a global organization, and of course they had to show me their knock. You know, the huge pane of glass and 20 people sitting oh, there no, using uh, <laughs> Remedy and HP OpenView and who knows what else. And then they went, okay, this is for show. Now let us show you what we actually use. Right. And they brought up SolarWinds. <laughs> no, I, I'm finding that, you know, I've worked in for a fairly large enterprise and it, it's just that's the challenge. And, you know, you get this huge suite of products and trying to. Uh, it, Pay attention in, to in that it. particular environment, either. it was the networking team saying, we can't get the reports we need from that right. thing, because we need link utilization yeah. to present our management, and we can't get that. So we do it our own way, and they just bought SolarWinds. That means working with the apps team. <laughs> or running our RD tool. Okay. Uh, it's but not uh, good. To, 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 to work when, obviously, Better, yeah. we, we understand that. Yeah. Uh, there is one particular challenge whenever you're dealing with uh, complex IPSLA oper uh, operations, and that is a very simple problem of time synchronization on remote nodes. Because if the clock is drifting on a remote node that you are testing, your uh, echo tests are going yeah. to drift as well, and you may think that you're experiencing increase in delay when you're actually not experiencing that. Is this something that you are uh, trying to address at all with your software? Again, to what Joel said earlier, we haven't had enough customers say, this is a problem for us. We have this issue where our, our routers aren't sick, and so can you help us with that? If we did have that said, then we'd prioritize that oh, and look at addressing it. Everybody's in TP and it works. Yeah, I mean, when you just, I mean, is that ah. kind of like a, See, that's a I, weird I, I, backwards I can, I can tell you to be When I was sitting in a design meeting, yeah. when we talked about the clock synchronization, and I said, why don't you use NTP? Yeah. I can still hear laughter. Uh, uh, echo in my ears what? from that answer because NTP's precision is just laughable. It's just a couple of milliseconds. Well, for what most of what we need, uh, I mean, uh, it <laughs> depends on what you're trying to yeah. do. Yeah. 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 in a mobile yeah. environment yeah. where we need to have uh, a cell phone call handoff and uh, uh, three of of a second precision. That's where I suggest using NTP. As I said, I still. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> laughter so you learn something. <laughs> learn something. <laughs> no, but, 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 but the thing is that I have been part of, of troubleshooting a particular customer issue where we had a serious problem with the clock drift in a way that the way they were measuring the performance of their network was the result of the clock on the remote uh, machine having one second last for one second and let's say three milliseconds and that was increasing the delay over a period of time until they rebooted the machine and then it kind of got back yeah, or yeah. when the precision got to the point where NTP could correct it. Yeah. But they, and, were, and they again, thought that they were experiencing the For the customers we, that we see and work with in the mid-market, that's not an issue. I was just asking. But it's, a, but it's an interesting and fun point and now I know not to mention NTP if somebody's talking well, about I mean, but NTP <laughs> Stratum 1, I mean, it, it, for most people, that's it, yeah. if you're using a Stratum 1 GPS NTP server, that should be fine. GPS is Strapping to a No, no, if you've got a GPS, you're strapping one. No, it's strapping no, two. The GPS is strapping one. Right, that's true. Okay. Well, you're going to get picky now. Okay. It's cool. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Back to your comment. Well, the, the comment that I have is because, and it actually worked out well that we let that go because you, you said the magic word, commoditization of IT. <laughs> well, one of the things that commoditization has brought us oh, is a dirt of devices, even just sitting around this table, that run wireless. 
and some comments from a couple of yeah. former delegates here said, you guys have never really given a lot of visibility in wireless with your products. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten a lot of request, feature requests from your customers for that? And is that something you either have now have or are currently working on? So kind of yes to all of those. So uh, I'll show sure you what we have now. That was easy. And the, yeah, <laughs> the, the, the good answer is it's not, the answer is not we have a separate product for that. Um, at one point we actually did have a wireless product and we actually folded that into NPM, our main network monitoring product. And Which I think is a good idea because, and the wireless guys are probably going to agree with me here, it's time, most people nowadays don't look at wireless as a separate entity right. like voice mm -hmm. or like security. It's all one part of the network because people don't care how they connect anymore. They just assume that there's wireless. Right, exactly. And, and back to the commoditization aspect, wireless is just, a, from a feature perspective, if we said, oh, wireless, you need to pay separately for that, that's like saying, well, I need to pay separately for you know, a switch or a router, or I need to pay separately to monitor a access switch versus a core switch or something. You know, it's just, for the way we work, it's not necessarily a, um, a value. So the wireless functionality, we haven't done a lot. We've added some support for additional vendors. So uh, we added support for Maru recently. We have support for Aruba. Of course, Cisco and HP, we've had support for a long time. Uh, both the autonomous AP, we can go collect information from it, or if you have a controller, we'll go to the controller, connect to all the information. So as far as wireless support, uh, so I'm kind of jumping around a bit. What you're looking at now is NPM. And just as a side note again to kind of orientate those who aren't familiar, um, this is our Ryan, th these are all running on our Ryan platform. And we have network, which is NPM, our NetFlow, NetFlow product, config, NCM, network configuration manager. Each tab represents a different product, the a la carte mode of, okay, you need to know NetFlow. Okay, well, we can buy the NetFlow product. Most of them you can buy individually. NetFlow is one where you do need to have NPM, but if you just want configuration management, you can just buy NCM. So, uh, so within uh, NPM, we actually have wireless, and you click on wireless, again, you go add the controller, go add the, the AP, and then we'll collect all the information. This is showing all the clients in, in our lab, in our uh, demo environment, the name, the SSID it's associated with, this IP, the MAC address of the client, its signal strength, when it was connected, how much the data rates, how total bytes sent and received. Well, it has it getting this SNMP to each WAF? Yes. And right. then can you dump, can you do a, an import from, like, uh, from, a, from Cisco or something like that? Can you there's not direct import there for our discovery process. You can list an IP, if you have, if you export just a list of the IP addresses, then in our discovery you can add them. But that's just, again, adding the controllers and the access points themselves. If I show it by access point, uh, it's by, by the left you can see it's grouped by vendor. Um, here are all the individual APs. I can see what, um, if they're a thin or thick AP, the SIDs are broadcasting what channels, and how many clients are associated yeah, with them. Cool. I mean, are you gonna, and I can expand them out. Are you gonna so. build this out more? Because, I mean, frankly, you can get a lot of this stuff from the controllers themselves. You can. You could go to con yeah. any controller and do this, but in larger environments, you have the one pet place to go for all your other network performance data and the wireless data. So, honestly, other than adding device support, we haven't had a lot more requests around building out the wireless functionality. Mm -hmm. Could it be built out? This Absolutely. There's a lot more you can do with it. But for most people, this is the information they need, and I can show you the report. So, and, and based on, anyway, as you're going through this, based on what you said about your previous product with IPL CLA and, and this product now, you guys are totally driven by what your customers are asking for. So in essence, if the customers out there want to see more types of this functionality, they need to approach you. And it doesn't just yep. need to be the bars and the, the, the geeks like me they keep saying it, you need to see that, that demand driven from the entire customer base so that you can take it back to the product management team and say, 60% of people that we sell to want to see this, I think it's time we put it in here. Exactly. Well, and do you, how do you work? Do you, is it like a, a formalized process of a feature request or is it an informal kind of <clears throat> yeah. thing? Yeah, so, and, and again, I enjoy talking about this, this is what I do, so it's fine, but um, if anybody else is wanting to make sure we cover another area. It's good. Okay, good. So, uh, I'm a, so I'm a product manager, so I work with customers every day. I literally talk to a, a, at least one customer a day. In addition to having FWAC.com, our online community, so we get a lot of feedback from there, a lot of feature requests. And sometimes customers get frustrated because they say, we've been asking for this for a long time. And we say, you're right, um, but there's all these other things that other people have been asking for as well. So there's always more stuff that we can do and you know, would like to do than that we I should say we'd like to do than we can do with you know a certain amount of resources. Again, we have the low price point. We're trying to provide most value for the most customers, and being able to say 
to do everything is just not realistic. So we have to prioritize. And the way we do that is to talk to as many customers as possible and understand what problems they're having today, what are the biggest pain points, and what are the ways that we can quickly solve it. So I'll talk to a customer, take notes, and say, tell me, you know, just a lot of times it's open forum of, what do you, like, why did you buy NPM? What do you, what do you, what's the most important value you're getting out of it, and what's the biggest gap it has? Well, if it just did this, then it would save me an hour a day or an hour to four hours a week, you know? And so we take that input and we say, okay, now I know this question that I may have not have known to ask. Because we do surveys as well. Um, we send out email. We also email a lot in general, um, as most of you may probably know. But we'll do a survey and say, here are the features we're looking at adding. What's your priority on these various features? But you don't know what those features are unless you're regularly talking to customers and understanding what problems they're facing and, and what's kind of the, how the market is changing in their day-to-day -day tasks. So we, again, it's, it's very user-driven, constant feedback. Do we add features that customers don't ask? Yes, there are other business priorities that we meet, but the majority of our development is based around requests that come from features, uh, from users um, for, for various features and functionality, device support, um, technology support. And, and wireless really, surprisingly, we haven't had that much more requests for more wireless information. So is, it comes up sometimes. Is license compliance on the network devices something you keep track of and can alert on? So NCM does some basic ability of that. <clears throat> I have several customers that regularly bite themselves in the butt with mistakes on licensing, whether it's you know too many clients being tracked by a mobility services engine or. Yeah. Um, you know, not enough licenses for DSX host in the next 1000D, or you know, things like this that you know they constantly run into these. Yeah, say, does Vima have a license report at all? I don't think so. Yeah, the 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 the, the thing that we're talking about earlier was we collect a lot of data, so we may not out of the box provide that, but we might have the data to be able to answer that question. And it's just a matter of saying Anybody who knows to ask it. Yeah, doesn't have the problem. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Kind of. So it's it's something that again talking about the party from users. I don't see a lot of, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of what the biggest problem within a license perspective we see. I mean, like I said, NCM can pull some of that data. Uh, we have, so we pull a lot of data out of the box for SMP for polar, for CPU, memory, interface utilization, there's discards. Um, but we have a um, custom polar, a universal device polar, and we can pull literally any MIB and any value. And so you can say, pull this value and build a report and tell me if this number is over this other number. So you can do some basic math in there and, and pull out your total license, your active licenses and your total licenses and just run a simple report. Um, I mean, it's it's a pretty straightforward thing to do. If you know exactly, if the device the has that available via SMP and you know exactly what you're looking for, you can... Yeah, that can make the nodes turn yellow or red in the reports. Not the nodes. Um, APM, which is our application product, <laughs> um, is another very flexible thing. So NPM allows you to do any custom SNMP polar you want to build, but you won't impact the node status based on these polars. However, APM, uh, you know, which is actually now our server and application product monitoring product, you can build a custom template. Each of these templates are composed of component monitors. These component monitors, we have about, I think, 50 or so, 40, 50 different monitor types. And each monitor type can be a, um, like a WMI counter, it can be a custom script monitor, it can be a, a VMware API monitor, so you can say, go pull the specific statistic from my VMware host or vSphere and compare, compare them, and, and if the statistic is out of whack, then change it to red because my license count is hitting some threshold I want. Um, there's port monitors, memory monitor, I mean, APM wasn't really kind of the focus here, but it's very customizable and flexible and allows you um, to do a lot of those unique things very easily, I, I might add. Uh, and at the end of the day, we have custom script monitor. So if you have a Linux box, we'll tell that in, copy some script, execute the script based on the return results of that script, update the status of the component monitor. And so from there, you can do whatever. I mean, there's some limitations on the data you can return, um, but I think we actually even made some improvements on that recently. So uh, there's a lot of power there for customization, but it's can I go back to, uh, to wireless? I have a sure. question from uh, from Twitter. Sure. Uh, it says here that uh, uh, from what, what you mentioned, they are not clear on whether this is true. Uh, you have to add every single access point. So if, if you have autonomous APs, mm -hmm. yes. If you have the controllers, you don't have to go. You add the controllers. So yes. uh, so you you, are, you can go and read the information from the controller, and you will add the access points. 
Yes. And then have you fixed? Here. Evidently, there was a bug in a previous version that you couldn't do that from a Cisco wireless LAN controller because getting the entire config out of it's a two-step process or multi-step process. So there's an issue with configuration management on the WLC that's different than wireless monitoring. Okay. So you can add the controller and get wireless data, but I know some users had some issues with the um, the blade, and there was something with the configuration management. I, I don't run NCM, but I do remember there were some users that had issues backing up those configs. Are you working on it? I think it's. I can check. I'll, I'll find out, Jody. Okay. Because th th there are a couple of people online who are interested in that particular aspect of the functionality. Yeah, okay. Okay. I, I have to make the moment we mentioned the wireless. The Twitter exploded. Yes. With questions. We don't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's because Blake doesn't do anything else but monitor. Twitter. He doesn't do anything else. I mean, you can use help. Uh, yeah. Just we use SMP because it's more. Everybody yes. actually has it. Yeah. Just I mean, I know not everything. Everything we sell uh, they actually lead towards <laughs> proprietary protocols, but. Whereas SMPs, I don't, SMPs, know. I don't know why they just don't it. use standard at the moment. Yeah. Uh, just to confirm one more thing. Sure. Uh, I, I think I understood right that you also get all the statistics from this center because that certain company hates SNMP. <laughs> so, so yes, we uh, so for his, a history lesson, we originally had support for VMware. I think it was three five had SNMP support, and then when they moved to four zero, they dropped support for SNMP. I, I may be wrong in the exact versions, but. Back in the day, they had support for SNMP, and they dropped it, and our customers just lit up. I mean, they're like, what happened? How can you not support this? And we're like, we're, we were working on that very quickly. <laughs> and so we started to use their API to pull the information. So, so now we use the API. You can add an individual host or go through vSphere, and we'll use the API to collect all of the, I'll show you. And, and I should also say that NPM and APM, or NPM and SAM, both have basic virtualization monitoring. So you can add the you can add the vSphere or add the host, and we can get information about all the guests that are mm -hmm. running on that host, the overall resource utilization on the host, CPU, memory, network, the state of all the VMs on that host. But those are just kind of the basic. Again, back to the commoditization discussion. These are the basics, like basic monitoring. You should have that, right? Like if if you're not monitoring any virtualization or any wireless, then as a network monitoring product, you're not doing very much. So. Within this, um, you know, we're, here's some data we're getting. Here are the two VMs and how the, they're consuming various C, uh, re CPU resources on this host, and a, just a whole bunch of powered off VMs. Uh, and then here's the memory for the very, from the two hosts and then the network traffic. But we have a whole separate product, Virtualization Manager, that goes into much more uh, detail about, let me uh, load that up real quick, uh, for virtual environments. So it has great reporting, analytics, and um, I'm not the best person to talk about Virtualization Manager, but I'll um, show it to you guys real quick. And so Virtualization Manager is one of the products that's available as an appliance and not a Windows app, so just something to know there. Uh, ah, so you can actually get a VM that you start on anywhere. Yep. And it just works, you don't have to install it yeah. or anything. Yeah, so cool. the virtual appliance model, very good. Surprisingly, um, we have users that have issues with the virtual appliance process, okay. which we thought when we saw, like, look, this is no brand, it's easy, you dump it in. But so we've done some things to help users get through that once they download it, walking through the steps of deploying the virtual appliance. But um, here is Virtualization Manager. Um, the UI is very different. This is through an acquisition year and a half ago, I guess. Uh, more than a year. 11, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and so we're, we're working on providing some integration across the other Ryan uh, platform products as well as our uh, storage product, Storage Manager, which gives you more detail on the storage. So uh, Virtualization Manager gives you a ton of data. The, the big value that also is the Query Builder. So you can query pretty much anything. Let me go to the map. Yeah. It's kind of a good way to see. What hypervisors does this support? Uh, right now, uh, all the ESX-based hypervisors, and they are adding, adding right now uh, Hyper-V Hyper support. <laughs> So just out of curiosity, since we're all in here, um, VMware, Hyper-V, Zen, like what's the distribution of what you guys are seeing out there? VMware. 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 <laughs> VMware. I mean, yeah. do you hate yourself? I mean, the yeah. <laughs> we're a big Microsoft shop too, and there's no Hyper-V traction at all. It's all right. VMware. Yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah. they can't even give it away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so, and so that's so that's why traditionally even an NPM like an NPM we only support VMware virtualization manager still said currently supports uh, VMware adding support for Hyper-V, <coughs> but every now and then we'll get the request from one customer here and there and says oh I really want Zen and we say yeah we understand that but mm -hmm. you're one of a 
thousand people that are using it. So um, once once that changes, maybe then we'll add more support for that. But for now, um, let me just go back to the map. So you can see your clusters, the applications running on individual hosts. Um, I'm trying to. So did you guys say this was an acquired product that you guys yes, brought yes. in? Because mm -hmm. it's a very different looking feel to yes, the rest of yes. the product. So this is just a Flex UI, whereas we have where all of our products are. You know, that was a company called Hyper9. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I remember that acquisition. Yeah, I think it's the beginning of 11. Yeah, yeah. January last year. Yeah. So, um, so we have another product also uh, that is also a virtual appliance, which is our login event manager which was also an acquisition, so it will also look slightly different than any of this one or any of the Orion products. What do you mean by log and event manager? Is it a log correlation tool? Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. And what, it, what platforms does it support? So we have connectors, and I'm right. actually trying to launch a demo, but there's something I've been trying to launch for a while. So uh, log and event manager, as you can assume, does basic logs, right? Send any log to it and... Sys we'll, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, no, uh, yeah, syslog. And what we do is we, we normalize those Windows. Yeah, Windows. event logs. Um, we normalize that log data, so we can say, you know, um, access list violation or on one device, on Cisco device, as opposed to an HP device or a Juniper device, there's they're the same type of event, right? So we can normalize it and say, okay, this source and this destination, and here's the access list that hit and the rule that, that, um, that it had issues with. The uh, logs are different in their format that they come to us, so we build a connector and normalize that out to say, at the end of the day, this type of event is the same across devices so that when you say I want to see all of my violations for access list we don't say well you, you have to figure out the format because they're different we just say here's the the actual kind of metadata that you need to understand what's going on. Do you do uh, firewalls too? Or is yes. this yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. There's, there's... Which one? Uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, pretty much sure uh, all, pretty much all of them that yeah. are out there, yes. We have a team that actually is there also to write you know, rules for any device that we don't support. So when they come up to uh, support about you know, a device tab that you know, may either generate new type of logs that, we are not, that the, the product has not seen before, then we have a team that actually kind of deals with, with those new log so formats. You can parse, you can alert, yes. you can... Yeah. So what about... Um, and then it helps take action. So like a common example, um, there's... And I, I'm trying to pull it up so I can just show it to you. But so the, the product actually is a, is a full SimCM platform. It's just that the way we w go at marketing it is really on the operational side. But that product can do all, everything that you need a Sim product to do. Yeah, it's so just that right now, from a go-to-market perspective, for us, security is not a primary market that we want to go to. And so there's a lot of demand for us on the operational side of log management. And that's why we use that platform for more operational one. But all the reports that are in the product and things like that, they are definitely you sim oriented. Like compliance reports? Oh, yes. Can you do? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And what do you use? This uh, MySQL backend database? No, it's a Vertica database right now. And okay. uh, Lucene also is used for full text search. So there's a mix of. Do you, of do you, like, do, you do something with like Sphinx? Do you. Uh, Normalize the data prior to putting it in the database. We have two stores. Data, we have two stores. There's one store that has the normalized data, and there's one okay. store that has the uh, raw data that is used then for forensic analysis and things like that. What's? Uh, how are you guys with? I mean, is, does law enforcement accept your formats? I. You know. What's well, we say accept. They well, use like, our products, but do they accept our format for like legal cases? I, yeah, I, I mean, would say. I, I mean, uh, am I going to have to maintain a, a straight up syslog server in addition to your product, no, or can I shouldn't. pull a report and it's yeah. acceptable? The for raw syslog. It should be, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I was the same. It I'm sorry. The same. You're talking about LEN? Yes. Yeah, yeah. LEN was previously the same product from the security company that was involved. Okay. Yeah. Tri Trigeo was the name of the company. So okay. they've been around for a while and they have pretty broad support. I'm, I'm trying to get. Yeah, here's one. Uh, I do have a, another question from Twitter. And um, all of these products that you're talking about, um, do they support uh, aggregating multiple locations and aggregating the data for central reporting? And what about the multi-tenant support? Okay, so I'll address the first question first. <laughs> so the way that Orion, and again, it depends on the product family you're talking about, but the Orion platform is when we talk about anything that, that looks like this. Yeah, the Orion, that's okay. Right, so, uh, so the way it works is from a scalability perspective, we have polling engines, right? Um, well, there's actually a deal that, that I was working with the customer right now on. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, it might be good to draw, and I'll start okay. talking about it while Joel's uh, drawing. Should I, Steve, should I turn this off so we can... 
Yeah. Draw, what's the best way? Yeah, but I want, yeah. want to come back to it, so I don't want to. Yeah, no, it'll, it'll turn itself back on pretty well. So. Cool. So, so you can buy, I'll use a simple case of NPM. You can buy NPM and run it on one server, and you can point it to everything in your network, and it'll run, and everything's good. Um, so however, if you have different, or Joel, do you want to? So the way it works on the Orion side is what we have is you have different instances of Orion that can be deployed into an environment. And, and the reason why you do that can be for reachability, you know, separation of different you know, business units that want to have their own separate groups. At the end, somebody wants to have a global view of the whole enterprise. So what we've done is there's a product called EOC, which is our uh, Enterprise Operation Console which basically can federate the data from multiple Orion instance and bubble the value you know, into a single pane of glass. You know. um, so the way that works is uh, right now it's by uh, polling on a, on a, we basically have middleware on every single one of those Orion and basically EOC use that same middleware and then communicates with each of the underlying it's kind Orion. It's an umbrella. That's right, kind of yes. Like. No, uh, one other thing that we are kind of looking at in the future, there's really no data about that. Is really kind of to build this kind of functionality directly within the Orion so that the Orion themselves can be federated at their level. And then from any of them, you could potentially actually roll up the data of other Orions, you know, as long as you have that module in the Orion. Right now, this is another product with kind of its own infrastructure, and we kind of want to get away from that. But right now, we can answer that question. You basically have that you know, available to you. And here, basically, there's another level of, of, of scalability, I would say, behind here, where you can basically have, uh, you know, right now, at this <coughs> level, what you, you have is there's usually a SQL server that's basically attached to each of those Orion instance. But what we have is we have those additional polars that you can also deploy for reachability, uh, you know, scalability, any of the type of scenario where you would want additional horsepower, basically. And each of those basically and will will basically update that central database that that. Kind so of is that central an situation where you want, say, you have a, a remote site, and, and will it hold data until it yes. can push it? Yeah, yeah, you can definitely do that. One other thing that we're well, kind the, of the whole data and push it thing is you no, know, like we expect a connection to the database from the yes. polar. So it's not going to cache that data if the, if you lose a WAN connection. Yeah. So <coughs> so. Oh, so but uh, one of the polar doesn't have any that doesn't have any cache. Correct. No, but that's something that we are yeah, that, 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 that we are yeah. actively looking at yeah. at yeah. building is basically <laughs> providing well, it, that. It, it, so yeah, it depends. It depends for which case. I can understand it from yeah. a security point of view, but from operational point of view, you know. No, so even logs for correlation. I mean, I, if you want, if you want to keep good baselines, I mean, I, I don't want to lose any of logs. Yeah, 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 yeah from a log perspective, yeah. yeah especially the one, the one type of you know with the WAN link in between. And, and I mean, getting a uh, link to SQL. Yeah, you know, I mean, if you're trying to do real time. That's why I was asking about Sphinx. I mean, you could legitimately, if you don't have enough caching, you could lose. Yes. Yeah. And so the model right. that we are moving towards is basically to have, if you want, local data store at each of those. You know, and those will not be you know, SQL server licenses, this will be a local store, whether it's, uh, you know, some type of local, uh, you know, MySQL, whatever, you know, some, some cheap storage, basically, uh, that doesn't increase the cost of ownership of that particular node. And then um, those will basically then, at that point, you know, either communicate directly through, you know, the main instance here and not have direct connections to SQL. And then the main instance will actually dump the data into, or, uh, you know, into the main SQL database. So that's kind of the, 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 the model that we are evolving to. Right. But, but, but to again, to answer the, you know, the, from an engineering perspective, that's the model I would like to have been two years ago. You know, the reality of the business is that we have so many other features that you know, customers are asking us that we always try to kind of build some of those very long running you know, efforts in parallel with just delivering values for the customer. You know, we tend to release uh, every six months to yeah, have uh, you know, at least yeah. one release, one major release, which puts a lot of pressure on the engineering organization to kind of make sure that backward compatibility is maintained and all that stuff. And so, you know, it takes us a lot of time to actually get some of those, you know, kind of longer term uh, goals to actually get, get done. But eventually they get done. Like, you know, for a while we didn't have the integration correctly. And finally, you know, we decide, okay, it's time to get this, you know, the right way, and then we, we finally did it. So performance is my biggest problem at the moment with SolarWinds. Yeah. I mean, where I'm working in, in the, you know, in the last five companies, we've all got SolarWinds, 
without doubt, the performance of the polars, the yep. performance of the server itself is the single biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. Now yep. I'm working at the bigger end. Yes. I'm working networks with five to 10,000 devices and we're polling you know, tens of thousands of weeks yep. to bring it back with custom monitors and stuff like that. I just cannot scale it. Mm -hmm. We're now to the point where we're actually saying we won't buy solar winds, we're buying other people's products because I can't run them on solar winds. Yep. I can't get the performance, so I can't load any more. Mm -hmm. So I'm deliberately not buying solar winds because I need to keep what I've got going. I yep. can't afford to. I so so one thing to I'll say. On. I can't afford to put NetFlow on because I'll just slow it down too much. We want to increase scalability, but we're not going to increase scalability unless we, as you know, make some of these other issues fa faster. Because my current team, like the current team I work in, has 20 people running solar winds at least two hours a day each. Yeah. So you know, it's not uncommon to have 10 people sitting on a solar winds page pulling data. And yeah. The performance is really. And we, we actually have an additional polling. Are y'all using the additional polling uh, web server? So we have. Yeah, no. Okay. So that's you know that's an internal problem. You know, yeah. Because solar winds doesn't fit inside of an ITIL compliant project. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, so to get money to make to break it up, you know, you've got all the answers, you know, you can break it up yeah. in pieces. Yeah. Finding an ITIL compliant project that I can create a scope of works to break it up into pieces and fund the professional services and the new instance and the, you know, welcome to the world of consultant driven yeah. 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 And, and one thing I, that I'll say that from a kind of easy solution that we're working on, as well as what Joel's talking about with the asynchronous loading of the resources. It's just breaking up the pages, yeah. so we're not loading sixty resources. Yeah, and um, yeah, the left browser can handle some of it. If it's right, and I can actually show you if we want to go back I, a quick little. Um, just press the yeah. I've done my part. Yes. Uh, why, uh, <laughs> yeah, need a second. Need uh, a second. It's white, you know. Come on. <laughs> might need a second. my other part. It might need a second push on the button. No, it's on. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's getting there. Uh, while you were doing that, uh, if you can go back to the question that I asked. Uh, oh, sorry, the second what, question uh, on multi tenancy. Okay, yes, yeah, so that was the second part. So um, we have customers that are using it and today like that. There are some problems with it. That's mm -hmm. the summit, right? So. Um, a lot of the problems we see around it are, I mean, the way you can do it is you set up group, we have account limitations and view limitations. Most people use account limitations, so, so they say anything with this node name pattern or with this IP address pattern, um, you can use, um, limit it and only show me those nodes. There are some areas that, 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 that doesn't work great and it requires a little bit more customization because now I have to go build custom reports for mm -hmm. all of my customers based on that node. They, don't, they can't just run that. Well, they, they can, but there, there are some, some, some issues with that. The, the problem we run into with multi-tenancy more comes in the, the MSP use case where you actually want to pull customers with overlapping networks. Yes. And so you say, okay, well, I have this same, same subnet and it's different customers. Yep. All right, so I can have different, a, a polling engines pull that, but because you have to have different routes to those networks, right? From the same IP address, I'm unless sure you're using sure. BRF or something to, to route it, you're not going to be able to mm -hmm. get to that network. So that's something that we recognize could be improved upon, mm -hmm. but we have a lot of customers that are being successful today using account limitations, using multiple polling engines. 
Um, na the NAT uh, approach and, and works. The thing that we've seen with the, uh, the polars. With, 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 with the polars and the aggregation with it. What, what's the name of that umbrella product? EOC. EOC. So I, I'm guessing that that one could be used. In for larger customers, yes. Um, yeah. But again, because you're buying EOC and you're buying an NPM instance to reach those customers. So if you're managing a small shop of less than 100 people, does it make sense to have a whole set of NPM and how much you're going to be able to charge back and get? Maybe. Maybe not. And it just depends on your business model. If you're managing large, several large customers, absolutely, you can use NPM. Give your guy access to give your customer access to NPM, and then you would use EOC to take a look at the entire environment, keep your eye on things. And when you need to know more, you would drill down into that individual NPM instance. It avoids all the issues with IP address overlap because EOC recognizes that and says. It doesn't need to know about the individual IP address because it's not polling or talking to it. EOC just talks to NPM and says, tell me what's going on here, shares that view, and... and Fair enough. Uh, polars, is this, is this, do those polars run uh, yes. in Windows or...? Yes, yes they are. Right now. They are. And, so, and you're talking about user accounts and mm -hmm. user access and permissions? Yes. Um, so <laughs> can I talk to LDAP? Yes. Um, so we have. I, I said LDAP, not. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> okay, so we I do have to AED. do. So I own, you can you only do AD. Um, yes. You own. I'm sorry. You only do AD. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can only install the product on Windows as well. So. Right. I know. But most you people can, have. I, I mean, you should. Well, so. I mean, let so me. Let me. We do LDAP. So we do LDAP <laughs> queries <laughs> against AD. We don't well, use don't the HC, so you know, so API so for that. So. No. In theory, it we could potentially work, but... So do I have to create the accounts locally and then use point to the AD server, or will it pull it in automatically? It will pull it in. Okay, so you can and let me just say that um, I want to advocate for... There are plenty of shops out there that don't use AD, and uh, there are standard authentication mechanisms, and I'd like to see Radius, yeah. I'd like to see straight up LDAP, I'd like to see TAC Plus. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we've heard that. We've heard a little bit. Good. Yes. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I have to admit that, that in many cases, yeah. uh, <laughs> and, uh, this, this is something that I have seen a lot, is that uh, many, many times you're not going to hear these kind of requests because people assume automatically that you don't support it. And, and I'm not talking about the Orion, but yeah. Yeah. the yeah, software absolutely. vendors generally, they say, oh, we're going to tie into AD. So you have many shops that actually use AD as a pass-through for their radius. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it's yeah. just an, yet and another thing that can fail in, in the chain of operations. And, uh, but so that goes back a to direct radio support would be a yeah, fantastic yeah. thing. But that goes back to why we talk, talk to customers directly all the time. And they say, you know what, I like the fact that you support AD, but really I'm just passing it through anyways. Can you add native support for that? That's the type of conversation that comes up um, when we give, we give the user the opportunity. Most of the users are pretty reasonable and they know that you know, here's my list of 30 things. They know we're not going to do all that. So usually they're pretty good at saying, here are the primary things that would make my life easier, or make things better, or just a small thing that would make a big difference for me. Uh, and so when we have those smaller conversations, that hasn't come up as much. I, we see it on Flack. I see that on Flack occasionally. And, and on the sales side, it comes up every now and then. But it hasn't been something that's, you know, adding AD support was, was a big, like, we didn't even have that two years ago. I think it was two, two and a half years ago. We didn't have that. It was just Orion local accounts. And so as we've started to add other authentication and uh, mechanisms, it's made a difference. But um, okay, so, so the, Go ahead. I, I just want to know, so when you say that like these features that, or, or those, those requests, you don't hear that conversation too often, yeah. but your requests are customer driven, I would assume that existing customers are going to fit into that Active Directory. It's the non-existent right. customers that have that request for straight that, that. That's a great observation, right? Like, right. if we're just asking our same customers what they want, we're going to get to this detail, this thing where we have very detailed specifics about people who already know what they're doing. And mm -hmm. it doesn't solve the customers that come up to us and say, oh, you don't do what I want. I'm going to go somewhere else. And so that's why what I said a minute ago, getting that feedback in the sales process and talking to people who are coming in and say, I just downloaded it and installed it for the first time. And this isn't working how I expected. Because we, unfortunately, we use the product so much that, you know, it's easy for us to know the quirks and go how to work around it. And then we get a new person on the team, and they're like, why do y'all do that? And we're like, it's a good question. No, that's a great point, because yeah. frankly, in my previous environment, if you didn't talk straight up LDAP, we're like, goodbye. Go yeah, home. like we're not even going to evaluate. We wouldn't over. even, it's, we're yeah. done. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the multi-tenancy question, so yeah. you have a great answer for the multi-tenant network. 
what about multi-tenant virtualization? Ah, good point. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, they have different. So, on the virtualization side, from a from a scalability perspective, we have different data collectors that you can deploy in your enterprise. That's kind of like the the same concept that we have between the Orion instance and the additional polars. We have that same organization on the virtualization side. No, I don't think that that's designed right now for handling. Uh, Big cloud director type no. of the yeah no, no not right now thank you yep. so what you're looking at here is I, I'm trying to get the IP address for the the box that I can actually demo this on to you for you guys but um, mm -hmm. just a, this is just a mock up right just a screen of what we we're talking about and on the left here you can actually see tabs and so you can add and, and again I'll, I'll let me kind of stress <laughs> this is like way way early development there's no even code working behind these are just like ideas we get we put them in front of users uh, and say screenshots. yeah yeah they're not even real no, screenshots those are photoshop photoshop yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah they, they haven't even made it to the screenshot stage yet this is just pictures that somebody drew uh, so mm -hmm. you could say instead of loading all these resources on this one page i'm going to add this little tab over here that has my configuration resources and, 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 and again, for, for a quick primer for people who aren't familiar with Orion, each of these little boxes are called resources. And you can hit customize page and add as many resources as you want to a view. And the more resources you have, the more data it loads, and therefore the slower the page gets. But if you come to this, this, uh, this home page, and you know you maybe you use this, um, this config snapshot resource once a week, but not every day. You go to the node page every day, and you want to be able to check on things. but you don't need to load this config snapshot data every time you go to the page. So we could push this off into this other section here. So when you go to the node detail, you just see the three resources you most often need. And when you want to drill in to a specific area, you would click this tab, and it would load the resources for how those would work. Does, does that make sense? That, Absolutely. OK, so that's another way we can solve the problem of we're trying to pull so much data, there's so much performance. Let's just chop it up into more easier pieces. Uh, just to give you one more idea. Sure. The, the things that you're not using often, you can just collapse them and load data only when I expand them. Yeah, yeah, that's another. Um, I don't think that was that came up in some of the design for this one, but yeah, and it, that that's certainly an option. Yep, and in, and a, a similar way that we do that is a lot of resources will will load the the kind of most recent or current data last ten or fifteen or twenty. And so instead of loading all the data that's available, mm -hmm. we'll just load the, the data that's most important for you. And there's actually a good, the new, should I show the new charting? Because there's a similar thing where we, it's, I mean, so again, for users I'll that. Uh, the web application like this. Enterprise computation. No. I think okay. it's on. These, these are applications have, done right. I, I have to admit, I, I'm. They do run on Windows, but we'll skip over that. <laughs> <laughs> It comes up every yeah, but, but now and then. But they can't be perfect, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, realistically, do you have appliances for all your products for people who really think Windows shouldn't exist? No. So the, the problem, really, I mean, we would like to actually do a virtual appliance for some of our Orion-based products or Windows-based products. The problem comes with the licensing of Windows. Mm. Which oh, okay, basic don't go down that road. Well, well, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not going that road, but that's the, that's, that's what the is limiting that's us yeah, right now. You, you wouldn't believe how much problems we have with that. Yeah, you I mean, wouldn't do a soft appliance on with Windows? Yeah. The what? They said we were not going that. Like that's well, the limitation. So no, for us, the cheapest way on the Orion side. We're not going to re-architect the whole product just for the purpose of putting it onto a virtual appliance. It doesn't make any business sense for us because we won't sell necessarily yeah. more software. So Maybe what we have to do is we have to take a look at what's available for us to be able to package that thing, you know, th those Windows servers, onto a virtual appliance. And if Microsoft, Microsoft has a program right now where they allow you to run an eval of your product as a virtual appliance, as a VHD. But guess what? That virtual appliance can't be transferred into a paid product version of Windows. So you basically are giving your customers something, they like it, and then after that they have to go back and provision a bunch of servers because they can't basically uh, you know, transform that eval version of Windows into a you know, licensed version of Windows. They can't have a Windows license for that? No, they can't. Okay. I mean, the the, yeah, the yeah. agreement for that program is basically preventing you to do that. 
Uh, the, the question that I have here, and uh, I, I think that you made a valid point there that it makes no sense to re-engineer everything just to make it virtualized. But what Ivan said, and half jokingly, but I believe that no one actually understood it as a joke, was that what about all those of us who think that Windows has no place in this kind of environment? And I mean, do you have any plans down the road to actually implement polars on some other platform? And not, one comes not, to mind, Linux. Not I mean, for <laughs> not for Orion right now. I mean, honestly, yes, you can say that there's a lot of environment where Windows doesn't have a space, the reality is that in most environments there are still Windows well, boxes. Well, performance-wise, I mean... Performance-wise, most of the Windows 2008 R2 boxes performs as well as, you know, for Linux what boxes, need, for, for what, what we need, need, you know, from that perspective. And, you know, I don't want to start a debate, you know, Linux versus yeah, yeah. Windows, fair, you know. Fair enough, fair, fair, fair enough. I, I'm just asking, I mean, uh, I understand that the, uh, okay. most of the functionality right. is actually on the, uh, on the server side. And I have really no problem with Ryan running yes. on Windows. Yeah. That absolutely no issue. It's the remote polar. You it's, want to it's the remote side. polars yeah. Yeah. that and could be. You know, never say never. But right now we have no plans basically of. of how, how hard can it be? It's just software. Oh, it's just software. It's yeah, software. Yeah, 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 yeah. I tell him that all the time when I ask for his stuff. Well, I, I want to make a point around this because my environment's almost 100% Windows right now. I'm data center licensed for my virtualization clusters. I mean, I we are in SPLA, so we can do service provider level stuff, which is stuff that you guys could look at and talk to Microsoft about licensing those Microsoft you know apps if you wanted to get yes. into SPLA. That said, though, I mean, it, it limits huge opportunities to have, say, data center switches like Arista that have an entire overhead Linux kernel that you guys could put a polar in, mm -hmm. and yeah. you could license that. Or, yeah. or when I, I mean, I've got more than 200 edge sites right now that aren't my clients, but I've got the stuff on the routers that I could use as polars to pull my individual devices back on these networks yeah. that I don't know. But yeah. you can do that. You well, can use their what API. About I, I get that, but it comes back to the polar thing, and, yeah. and this isn't I'm anti Microsoft at all. No. It's not. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a client of yours. I'm not anti yeah. your product at all. It's just the fact that it, the more flexibility you guys could give us to get out there and into into our own market space that our clients, the more you're going to sell. I yep. mean, it's just a sales metric. Thing. Yeah, and, and I would just say real quick to kind of move on the conversation. Unless I mean, again, we can talk about this for the rest of the hour if you'd like. But the, the the it just comes down to. First, we need to solve remote polar well for the current product we have, right? The current product doesn't really do remote polling. It, if you have low land latency, you can get away with it, but it's not built for that. So we want to solve that problem first there. And then once we have a good remote polar, I think this conversation of, hey, look, I could just drop this at the, my customer site and on this, this, this Linux box and it would work fine. Then that will come up more. But I think it would be a very awkward thing as a, for an existing customer to see us come out with a remote Linux polar before supporting our current product environment and how the product strategy works for those existing customers. So this, I, I'm, I do agree this conversation will probably come up more. And you know, we're very into the feedback loop, as, as I think that you guys are well aware of. And as it comes up, we'll talk about it. It's just not the things that we're doing in the next year, the next two years. You know, we not really even looking at the long-term solutions of how we do it. It's an interesting conversation. That's where we're, that's where we're at. In the well, as a client, I'll set up an auto post and plan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in our environment, we we desperately need multi-tenant network management, and there, and there just isn't a good solution right now. And we've tried several different things, and we hear that that feedback from every single vendor. Well, we don't. We're not hearing. You know. That we're gonna, or we're not gonna do that, or you know, maybe in the future. What's well, so that? You like are special, a, but well, but uh, I'm not. The multi-tenant, multi-tenant network management is not. It, it's coming up more and more we, for us. We would love yeah. to. We would but what's your biggest more. problem yeah, with so the multi-tenant <laughs> area? Whenever you go to see products, is there anything one that just just did not doesn't work for you guys, or is it just nothing's complete enough to use? Um, what's it's, the, I think. Well, number one, the solutions that are out there are kind of a mess. Like I don't want to put a polar out at 10 million sites. <laughs> yeah. You know, I would. I'd rather have honestly. Um, we were looking at putting, uh, Zabbix has their, it's like Asian or proxy, whatever it's called, it's yeah. like a polar. Putting those in Linux containers on a box and then pulling back MPLS VPNs and attaching those containers by a VLAN to those VRFs. Yes. That way we didn't have to have 10,000 boxes. Every time we had a customer, we just fire up another container, yeah. another VLAN to another yeah. perf. Um, and that would that would solve the problem. We even uh, talked to a vendor about doing something like InfoBlox. Where they're, they're multi-tenant, um, the way they do their multi-tenancy is they have multiple routing tables on their appliance. It'd be kind of cool if um, your poll, if you could have 
a device with multiple routing tables yeah. on it and attach a polling process to each routing table. Right. And then it, I think that would scale better, be better than deploying a physical box out of t a ton of locations. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that. but uh, so are those the big problems you see? It's more about how to actually get to the data than, than right. using managing, the product. Managing the overlapping IP space yeah. and just having a clean solution that it, that isn't, you know, that isn't going to cost us a ton of money. Yeah. You know, we, we manage uh, thousands of um, customer networks that come from a more service provider environment. Um, I think the rest of the people at the table do, I don't, I don't know, I'm making that assumption. <laughs> I'm better than all of you. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, uh, Nobody's arguing. First, we don't want to deploy 2,000 polars. We don't want to do that. That's yep. another Absolutely. thing we have to put out there. And customers don't want to put that at their locations. They want us to just manage their stuff. And how large are most of the customers you manage? Are these everywhere across the spectrum? They're all over, they're all, yeah, in terms of size, they're anywhere from three sites to 1,000 sites. Yeah. Well, we have, <clears throat> we're financial, I've worked for a financial services provider, and um, I mean, we can have little, like literally yeah. five or ten people size yeah, so, office. Yeah. yeah, so it could be well, really helpful double. to have, you know. Well, so for them, in, in those instances, you're usually not managing the desktop, and you're usually not like a server that you're managing there, I, I assume, but you have the, the router and the switch that you want to keep track of. Right. Usually the router will have a unique address, obviously. Right. The internal network may look the exact same. I, I don't know, but I don't know if there's a, a switch or a management address on that switch that you could access as well and but then but then but then now you're saying okay well I need a constant VPN to the site and that's kind of lame because it, I mean, then now all of a sudden you're tired no, yeah I mean yeah that's the reality of what it is yeah. but it's just it's it's unfortunate and then maybe the, the, the VPN connection goes up and down and you lose the data and you're like is it down because there's a problem at the site or is it down because the VPN tunnel is just down anyways um, I, I know we wanted to leave kind of 30 minutes at the, okay. it's, but, the and we continue. actually didn't even talk about one of the kind of cool things that was going to be interesting about on the, the database back and we talked about the uh, login event manager mm -hmm. having all these these logs and the data stores NetFlow having all of that data uh, our IPSLA product is going to start collecting call detail records so there's a lot of data there as well and how mm -hmm. we address that as a company and, and all the different solutions we're a SQL shop now uh, Microsoft SQL specifically, so um, there's some limitations on the data we're collecting and the efficiency of storing that in a row-based data storage as opposed to column. And so, it's 30 minutes. It's your guys' time, so y'all can tell us how you uh, want to. Uh, just one more question, yeah. uh, sort of around his question. So do you have an API that I could use to write my own folder? I would say that we. So yes, we have an API. Mm -hmm. Writing your own poll would probably be very ambitious. Um, of course. <laughs> <laughs> this is an ambitious guy. Yeah, yeah, so, that's um, and so there, there is basic um, CRUD operations available through our API. So you can create new nodes, you can update the status. Um, it's your API document. So, just so to, to go back to that. So, <laughs> so we, have an, we have an API for you to access most of the management capabilities of the software, like mm -hmm. the, all the managed, well, I would call all the managed entity that we collect, you can access through the API, like you have six nodes, interfaces, volumes, applications, I mean, depending on the product that's installed, you have access to that. And then a lot of those have, you know, verb, what we call verbs or action that you can perform on them. Now, writing a new polar for a new polar type, the, the only product, I mean, there are two extension polls that we have right now, and he talked about them both. The one is, one of them is the, the custom polar, uh, you know, the UNDP capability that we have in NPM, so that if it's SNMP-based and you want to do some logic on the SNMP data, you can use that. If it's uh, more, if it's something that fits outside of that and you can write a script for that, mm -hmm. then what you can do is you can, using APM or SAM node or uh, server and application manager product, there you can basically have the escape hatch is that if you can write VB script or any of those scripting language, you can basically write a script that will gather the data that you need and basically pipe that into the system. So that's, those are our answers right now. Now in terms of writing what I would call a native polar that or polar infrastructure can run that you know is, is more efficient than just running scripts. At this point, yes, we have an internal API that's not been documented just yet. Okay. So you don't, okay. there's not a public API that you can use to, uh, to pass events? Pass events like from external Wait. systems? No, pass it like a network event. It, the polar detects and it passes across the threshold, detects an event. 
you couldn't pass that backwards to an API. No, yes, you can do that. I mean, first of all, you could basically have alerting that actually serves as that API because that's a notification API that's inside Orion. So you could basically pipe that stuff and, and, and push that using that mechanism. You could push that using syslog. You know, we have, you know, we, we can push syslog messages also from Orion. Uh, if you look at the LEM product, you can also basically use that, you know, if you want to use, you know, and do any type of correlation on those events, you can basically reuse that particular, me you know, mechanism. And, you know, we, we have customers that actually are using LEM as kind of a, you know, overall console for event management and event aggregation across all our products. Because that's correlation what it does. You know, engine. that's exactly what it does. You know, it's a, it's a login event correlation engine, basically. So, and real, this is our, um, so uh, SolarWinds query language, Swickle. Mm -hmm. Studio, and so we have an API you can access, but then we also have an SDK that includes some config examples, the studio that you can actually use to, to query data and, and to kind of get an idea of the structure of the language mm -hmm. and the verbs. So um, you can download this, it's, e it's easy to play with. I don't know if there's anything you think is worth kind of. No, and so uh, you see the, the one that he has expanded there, which is Orion Events. Mm -hmm. You have access to that entity, and so you can pull that one regularly. We actually have a Publish subscribe mechanism where basically you can open a channel and say, hey, notify me when things are changing. Some of the entities that we have in the API are supporting it, some of them not. It's not well documented at this point, but it's something that we're going to document more in the future. And I would say if you have a question about it, post it on Slack. The, yeah. guy, the guys are really or, good about responding. You know, or email me or, yeah. you know, because that, that's what my team deals with is the documentation of that, that and API. These are read only. No, no. That's what I was saying earlier. Uh, the CRUD operations create, read, update, delete. Like we have full support mm -hmm. across. There's a, there's a table that shows which entities we can update and delete and add. So, mm -hmm. but there are definitely uh, like so you can so create so new so nodes. So you so can so add. Could, could I use that to insert data, polling data into your system? Uh, I don't think that right now the that's supported, but okay. it's there's nothing. It's not being tested. Yeah. So that's it's not architecturally impossible. <laughs> Yeah, well, no. at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's SQL, right? So yeah. it's just my, yeah. you, so you can just jam the data in there and we'll say, oh, thanks for sending us the data. And we'll, we won't know where it came from and we'll do a normal. Right. Again, so but from a, from a supported uh, perspective. Cooking to your SQL database, I could write my own polar, but of course it would la, 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 la. <laughs> I, I don't want to hear that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You, know, you do whatever you want with the SQL database. Yeah, you just sure. want to, yeah. don't come and complain if it, you know. Okay, okay, so, yeah. so, 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 so hold on, technically speaking, there will be a Linux polar coming up. <laughs> I think he committed to it. So, uh, yeah. I have so many other interesting things to do. <laughs> well, and, and that's the thing, it's a priori prioritization thing, right? Like, yeah, yeah we can sure. talk about it and say, that's cool, Absolutely. that's fun, but... I, I actually think, uh, and that's just my opinion, that putting an effort to have uh, a Linux-based polar would actually down the road, and not in that distant future, increase your sales considerably. Right. Because I'm sure that there are shops out there that simply don't want to run this on Windows. Yeah, Just Honestly, for the, for no, the no, sake I, of... I agree, agree that there, there are... are we, I worked in an environment where we would have kicked you out. Oh, it's on Windows? Check you later, bye. And, he, and here's the interesting thing. We've all used you know, the, the, the 10,000 open source little products yep. that are out there. Some are incredibly scalable and don't give us the reporting we need. Yep. Um, some of them look beautiful and don't do crap. Mm -hmm. You guys have probably the best unified platform out there, but you're minimizing a market. Again, I'm a client. I'm not going to step away from the product. Yep. But right. to scale this out oh, it's and good to, to win, new, win new markets. It's good to hear it. You know, for us, it's definitely uh, you know some additional data points that we need to bring back and you know gauge. You know, def there's definitely the fact you know we don't hear it a lot, but you know, obviously here we hear. You know, the concentration we, of that request in this room is, is pretty it's high. Sometimes as so. simple as, you know, we just don't, we have more resources to manage uh, NICs than we do Windows. Mm -hmm. And we only use Windows for this kind of functionality. We don't use it for monitoring and log event correlation yep. and management. Yep. You know, yes. yep. And for us, the, the problem is that that type of work will come in competition with making the website faster, for right. instance. And then what? You know, you're there. I mean. Ideally, yeah, we would solve all those problems, but we have to look at, you know, what will have the most direct impact right now for our customer base, and we have to solve those first. And uh, so that's what I'm saying. Linux Polar increases the customer base. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, by is, one, two, three, okay, yes. Yeah. No, and I'm sure we'll get a bunch of 
Yes. After this, you know, you know conversation, yeah, I don't, we'll I don't get plenty of. No, but I want a VM that I can. Yeah, a Linux, can, a Linux right. form that can be containerized and like right. a yes. Linux. That's form. it. Yeah, that's that's the one. That's the one. Yeah. I just want a VM appliance that I don't have to mess yep. with. Yeah, because I don't, don't want to have to worry about it. I don't want to have to go and talk to the Windows guys who want to use a corporate build. Yes. <laughs> and then, and then yeah. you can so by the time they put their corporate build with their patches and their virus scanners and their but all that trash, yeah. and, and then, then the Windows server is hobbled by 50% for performance. And yeah. then you got to remember too that security groups, you're going to say, oh, we're going to put this thing that has access to everything, it's going to be polling, and it runs on Windows. And the security team's going to go, yeah, we're not going to put that in our shop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. There's a security team yeah. in the world that trusts Microsoft to deliver a secure product. So I can't treat yeah. it as a secure product. I have to put it behind firewalls. Right, yeah. I have to have access controls and audits. And, and, I, and I get the priority statement, too. Give somebody a bounty inside to do it on their, on their own time. I mean, the problem is that we already have bounty inside on doing some other projects. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, I hear what you're saying. It's you know, great, yeah, it's, it's a great point. It's yes. just, um, yeah. Yeah. I want to make Steve Foskett feel relevant, so can you, can you talk a little bit about your storage stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> he has ears everywhere. Wow. Yes, I know all. Uh, I, I can, yeah. Uh, and just before you started, uh, did you guys uh, have any cooperation with Apple in uh, regard to your marketing? Because apparently every single question that we asked today was answered with, there's an app for that. <laughs> so from that there's an, well I, I done, think we had some in, in, internal jokes about that, but um, okay. yeah, not... You're not allowed to say it out loud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so storage, uh, this was through an acquisition two years ago, I yes. want to say about? Two years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. from a company called Tech Tools, and you'll see this is looking more like what you saw Virtualization Manager look like, and over time, it's getting there, it's not quite there yet, but... So, the thing to, to know about uh, Storage Manager is um, it actually has support for Linux, <laughs> um, but today it's we don't do it distributed as a virtual appliance at all, right? It's just the download, Windows download. No, it's something that's we're working on. Yeah, actually. yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, it's and again, I'm not really involved in Storage Manager at all, but I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, but you have to actually collect the data from the actual array directly, and that's probably where most people have the most problems is actually getting everything installed and up and running. And we've made it better, um, but there's still there's a good standard for collecting storage data, but not everybody implements it and implements it according to the standard, so it, it's kind of a little use. Um, vSphere provides some good storage metrics directly from it, but um, it can't kind of drill all the way down. Um, let's see what's good. Why did that refresh? So we support SMIS. That's our preferred way of getting the data. Uh, but probably, as, as uh, Marv mentioned, you know, the, the support across vendor for SMIS data is very shady. Uh, Sometimes you get, you know, the, the data exposed one way for one vendor, and then you expose, you go, it's just like you go to that same, you know, MIB, I would say, you know, it's not the name in, 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 uh, in, in, in SMIS, but, you know, that namespace is not populated with that data, and you have to go to yet another one, and it's just, it's very difficult to actually get a complete oversight of that, you know, overview of, of and, and consistent overview of all the devices. So we also have, you know, native API calls, uh, you know, again, some of the, for some of the vendors. Uh, we use common line uh, for some of those ones also that don't have a, a nice API. So we have a mix of, of, uh, of uh, access methods to the different uh, arrays that we support. But the complexity is, you know, when you install the product, you know, with networking, it's great because there's SNMP, there's this protocol that pretty much everybody supports. You don't have that with, you know, storage. You know, it would be great if everybody was supporting SMIS and had an SMIS provider directly hosted on their uh, RAE, but that's not the case. Most of the time, sometimes what you have is some vendors require you to have an SMIS provider hosted onto another machine that kind of, you know, aggregates the data already from different RAEs, and all those steps make it kind of complicated for customers to actually get the, the configuration right of, of their whole environment. But otherwise, once the data is in there, we have uh, kind of, we gather a lot of data with the storage manager products, a lot of data. Um, and the direction where we're heading is, we are, we are getting the product, this, the storage manager product and the virtualization ma manager product 
closer and closer. And actually over time, what you'll see is that this product will actually migrate inside the VMAN UI and framework so that we can basically have uh, kind of this end-to-end -end mapping between your virtualization environment and your storage environment so that you can basically see, okay, this VM is allocated, you know, it's running on this hypervisor, you know, which mounts, you know, it's v VMFS and VMDK are, are on this, are mounted on this LUN, and this LUN is backed by, you know, those three RAID groups and those RAID groups have those three disks behind them. You're going to be able to see that whole picture basically right there and see if you've got a, a loan that's you know over provision for instance you're going to be able to see okay what are the other uh you know vms for instance that are running on this that may be actually sucking all the you know the space that you know and and, and io from from that loan. do you have a timeline on that uh yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> will you share that with us ask an answer no. <laughs> so um all i can say is that we are we are actively working on that. That's that's the only thing that I can say. So this is not just a, a v, you know a PowerPoint type of thing that we are thinking about. This is the plans to get there has started. No, I can't tell you when that plan is gonna is gonna finish. But from all the other things that we've said about you know our release cadence and things like that, you know you you will see you you won't have to wait too long to actually get uh, you know first iterations of that convergence showing up. So I've just kind of been clicking around while Joel was talking so you can just see the, the various screens and, and the, all the data that he was mentioning that we collect. If you have the SMIS uh, provider uh, connector up and running and collecting the, the data. So it's, uh, I won't, we're kind of running short on time so I won't spend too much time on it, but I just kind of wanted to show um, just some of the different screens, the data, how we're collecting, how we're showing that data um, at the top view. There was a, a question to see a demo of NCM or some basic coverage yeah, or I'm network configuration about that, manager. Yeah. Configuration manager okay. is always a. Yeah, okay. sure. um, yeah. Are there specific questions around storage? I mean, again, I'm not very uh, familiar um, with storage, but I mean, while we're here. So, can can I do compliance reporting with it? Can I do. Uh, with NCM? You know, yeah, yeah, alerting so, yes. and all, you yes. know, the standards. Absolutely. Like, scraps. Yes. It's just like yeah. alter point. Oh, okay. So, I can actually. Do, I can schedule tasks as well as just yes. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, you can do also real-time change detection so that if something right. changes on the device it will yeah. you know we'll get that event. So and what, and what do you work with? What, what is it? In terms of what? Anything. Device, device support? Drives. Device support? I mean it's yeah, pretty, like pretty much pretty everything that supports range. CLI and you yeah. know. So you basically running this, you're logging into the device and then running it. Okay, so just like say uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. similar to that. So I can, and I can show you the, the templates, but you can build a config template that if you can Telnet or SSH to the box, mm -hmm. or even if it's menu driven, so you connect to it and you press down arrow twice, right arrow, and then press enter, and that's how you trigger a configuration download. We can do that with some little macro keys, and you build your template out to say, hit, you know, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, and then we'll download it. <laughs> 30 <laughs> lives! <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> Contra! <laughs> So there's there's a there's a couple of ways. So it's very flexible. Most people most those are older. You know everything now is pretty much command line driven. So we can support that. Let me just do a quick little uh, overview. So config summary. So I can come in here and say group by my Cisco nodes, uh, show all of those devices, and show me the configuration history for those devices. And I can click on this and take a look at the running config, um, the policy violations. So I can create policies and say this is how I've implemented uh, HIPAA or what I, it's important for me for PCI compliance. You build those policies, and then you come out here and. and you, do you have you can, a template for say PCI? Compliance? We have out of the box, yeah. But okay. I'm always careful to say that when you look at our templates, you'll see that. Like the demo switch. Demo. That the. Uh, what's that? <laughs> Just like the name of the switch, nothing else. <laughs> uh, that it's not really a real true. It's it's to say, like. This does not obviously make you HIPAA compliant, right? Like the whole point is it okay. it's it's Fair. more of a demo thing. If right. you could Fair. build it, like how you yeah. how you implement HIPAA in your environment, what's important, we'll provide you the tools to do it. So you can what say, the auditor say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can make your um, your community stream. You can't have a public SNP community stream, right? And it'll go out and say, okay, what devices are violating that? How is it violated? Okay, this pattern on this line of device. Did and, you see the PCI? 
the, the, the ones that we do have pretty good support for are the, the DISA state compliance, the federal compliance. Um, we built a lot around that. Um, yeah. I thought we had the I this thought it was in the had compliance. You can do a fast lab, but you can't ever yeah. anybody who you are. Uh, maybe, maybe no folder. I was pretty sure we had. This one probably has the most data, so it's a good example. Of data. I'm not sure if you don't have that one. But, uh, so, you know, versus Telnet, session timeout, and do you, logging and delays. Just the flat, do people upload um, additional ones to WAC and stuff like that? So for the policies, I don't think those are actually... You know, templates for... Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's the yes, shared sir. config templates on Flash. Oh, so you okay. can um, you can share yours, you can not share yours. But these are change templates, not policies. Sorry. So no to your first question, oh, but oh, oh, um, but okay. we do have these con config change templates. So you can say, you know, um, let's, I want to do this kind of change. I want yeah, to yeah, change this the discrete not, space. Not the compliance. Yeah. yeah. So here's one that, that I created to change the Cisco enable password. Nothing descriptive there. And so a lot of companies have to go out and change their passwords every 30 days, 60 days, 90, whatever. So instead of doing that manually for every time. Yeah, you this is much simpler than yeah. Ultra point. Yeah. <laughs> so let me walk you through one more thing on the config change templates. We also do, there's a lot of great inventory data as well in the CM. So you can say, all right, uh, I want to compare selected configurations. And I, forgot, I forget, did you say that you guys uh, hook into Remedy? Or so we can do integration with third-party help desk systems using SNMP or executing external scripts. Um, there's not just a kind of next next type of integration, no. but we have customers that have done it. We have some documentation available okay. for how to do it. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so if we had all our devices say in Remedy, and we wanted to pull it out of the database and like put it in that. For yeah, for that. For I mean, so for. That particular one, the easiest way would probably have to wear a script that uses our API to actually provision yeah. those devices in NCM. But it's a pretty straightforward okay. add node. By querying? Yes. Okay. You would query yeah. your database, yeah. basically okay. write a script that extracted the list from right. Remedy okay. and then provision yeah. them inside NCM. Yeah. Yeah. So here's just two different device configurations and devices. And you know we'll, we'll look at the, the changed lines on the device. The host name is obviously different, right? Um, you can look at the line that's missing or a line that's been added on one. So if you think that you have a bunch of edge switches that have should basically the same configuration, you know, different management address and different host name, you can see why is the behavior different. Let me just compare side by side real quick, and we'll go down and highlight what's, what's different on it. Um, and then the, the other kind of cool thing about this is I can just say execute a script, and I'm going to go execute a script on, you know. Can I, um, can I schedule that? So the scheduling, yes. Um, that's upload. You can upload a config, and you can say um, you can download. Transfer status. Um, let's see, the the config change templates are a little better for that. And so you can go run it. You'll see the the script results and the data back yeah, from yeah. that. But the config change templates are probably a little bit better for that because they provide you more control over how you're actually interacting with the device. And I can't remember if and I there's a way for you also through the API to execute scripts on some of those nodes. So let's say that you have a script that you've created outside of NCM that mm -hmm. you would like to execute. You can basically through the API you can just go in and, and call the execute operation on that node, and it will basically kind of you know, use the whole back end of NCM to actually execute that node and do the, you know, use the credentials that NCM has for that node. There's, there's, I want to show you the actual template, but our online demo doesn't have some trying to find the, uh, the box. Yeah, I mean, ideally, you know, for something like um, changing the enable password, maybe you want to Maybe you want to batch it, and you want to schedule it. <coughs> yeah, and and, you know, actually, and you want to like do a certain number of devices at a time. I don't know. Yeah, let me Maybe actually just walk you through using it. So, and say I want to change really? change the the VLAN membership. So I can say define variable. Yeah, I can say define variables and run. So in the script that I create, I can say this is a variable. So when everybody at runtime, I want you to ask for this specific <laughs> variable. So first, you select the nodes that you want to run it against. Um, so we're going to run it against not the AP, uh, this guy and this guy. And I want to find my variables. So this script has said I have a select ports variable, a VLAN remove variable, and a VLAN to assign variable. So it will go up there. I can select my list of interfaces. And it will say, OK, these are the devices you selected. Here are the interfaces on it. Which interfaces do you want to run this command on? Because I mean, it's just a script in the variable. Can I see a firewall? 
what if we have one in the Wow. And you're not going to see, again, at the end of the day, it's the script that's actually Yeah, I wanted to see that. I wanted to see if you, what the options are for a firewall. For maybe an ASA or something. Yeah, that's it. But again, this is just enabling net formats. So this is the configuration of the ASA, but I don't know if there's more. So, here, this, so this is the actual script that we built. Uh -huh. So here's some data about the script at the top. And then somebody was talking about how they feared curly braces earlier today. Pretty, pretty common command line syntax that you would expect. Like these are the actual, like see this, the CLI. So this means this is what I'm actually going to type in right. the command line. You can see the little at sign for here's the IP address. So, so these the, are the variables. So out of the box, this is all that you can do, that you do on an ASA. That yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like we don't have a lot of out of the box for your. Right. So if I wanted to automate, so I need to like do some development on that. Yes, you would need to develop it. But the the point being, if you have basic scripting um, experience, it's yeah. it's pretty straightforward to use. Um, Question: can It's its you, own scripting language. Uh, can you share these scripts on Quack? Yes, that's. Um, well, there are probably more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's what shared, what shared config change from the clock, and then you get it. Yeah. So we're on configura configuration manager. I don't want to take this totally off topic of the scripts themselves, but there's some new um, vendor stuff coming out, like what Arista's doing. So get a, get advice on the network. You can do some automation, especially around like XNMP and um, almost Jabra-like client communication between the devices. Are you guys looking at any of that, or are you just doing SSH, Telnet, SNMP still with those guys? Yes, so for as, now. So as far as pre-positioning stuff, yeah, you, that's not on the table right now. Yeah, so that's exactly <clears throat> what Joel was saying earlier about being on the edge. Yeah. That's not our goal. We don't want to be out there because those problems aren't well-defined and well-known, well-adopted. Absolutely. And so we say, you know what, once, cus once we get enough critical mass and people have deployed this and more than one vendor is starting to use it and there's real well-defined pain points around it, now we'll have support for it. Like, it's a curiosity, a curiosity yeah. question because they've got some really good ideas. We're not seeing them in large, large scale yet, but as they get more entrance into big data centers, I can see other vendors adopting it too because it allows yeah. you to kind of pre-position and just let everybody kind of learn. It gets back to that kind of yeah. almost controller-based switched environment. Yeah, yeah, and and again, that, like you said, it's all about adoption. Once yeah. it's well adopted, then we'll look at it because our goal is not to be at the, the forefront there. There's 10 minutes left, and I know generally there's some time left at the end. Do you guys, I mean, I can, we can keep talking all yeah, the way for the last 10 minutes. Just... Do you guys can do your own thing? What, tell me what you, what you want to do. Well, one thing we added to NCM recently was the ability to support uh, the approval list, so you can have a config change, send it to somebody else, they actually approve that change, and then you can run it, <clears throat> as opposed to just running it in real time. That's um, something that was requested a lot. I got a, I got a question. It's sure. not, not a uh, question. config question, yeah. but uh, any support for MediaNet? <laughs> so um, Cisco has talked about MediaNet for a while to us, yeah. um, and right now, no. Uh, it's something we're looking at. It's something that video is obviously, we're doing video now, it's everywhere, and making sure video is up and running and there's no problems and understanding video. It's something that we're very interested in and we're talking to people and getting a lot of feedback on. Whether MediaNet is the way we find out more information about that um, or not, it's still, you know, it's still, it's actively being discussed internally. It, is there, are you using it? Is it something you're looking at? Is uh, it? So, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, Okay. Yeah, no, it's, um, I usually hear about MediaNet most at Cisco Live when people go to session and then they come back and they come by our booth and say, hey, do you guys support MediaNet? And then the rest of the year it's real quiet because well, people aren't talking about it as much. Well, so we've got a, um, in a lab network, we've got a uh, Cisco Works implementation mm -hmm. and it, it's heavy at pointing you towards MediaNet. Yeah. Yeah, they've been they've been pushing that, uh, and like I said, they've come to us a lot to talk about adding support for it. We've looked at it; um, it's interesting. It's again back to the whole. It's not something that's well deployed. It's not everywhere. People aren't actively using it, so we're we kind of we kind of lag behind intentionally. So, and and also, I'm still I'll be curious to see how much people use MediaNet. IP using IP is to generate synthetic transactions on the network. It doesn't really impact the network too much because it's so little. Once every five minutes, 
doing video, synthetic video tests starts to actually, it can impact networks. So, you know, that's the question, are people going to run continuous video um, monitors to make sure to make sure that they can then run video monitors properly? If you have enough bandwidth, sure, but the day-to-day, -day, you, you don't want to have to dedicate this amount of bandwidth just for monitoring, or maybe you do, but that's, that's something I've heard some people have uh, concerns about. There's another product that, um, talking about synthetic transactions, um, that there was a question earlier about monitoring web transactions. And so IPSLA manager can do the network side. And then we have a new product called the Synthetic End User Monitor that we launched in August of 2011. And what it is, that actually record your steps as you go through a web application. So there are examples here of, you know, a Gmail login. So it'll, and, uh, it'll log in a Gmail with your account, tell you how long it took to actually do each of those steps in the web transaction. So you know where it took, if you're, if you're managing a web application, where the actual problem is. So step by step, it'll actually save a screenshot as well. This is probably a bad example. Uh, it'll save a screenshot of each step so you know if there's an error page um, and, and what's actually happening, if, if it's taking too long for each of those steps to occur. So like, here, it's a screenshot as it replays those individual um, steps in the video. So like, uh, download the file and the average of that. And these are last 10 screenshot failures. So it'll go through every five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever interval you want. It'll go through and click through these specific pages on your website. And so you can say, well, the, um, the shopping cart link is taking a long time to load. So there might be something going on there. I need to go troubleshoot more. So it's not going to actually dive into it. It's just going to. Right. It's not going to say, and here's the, the process that's, you know, has a memory leak. One of your competitors says, you know, oh, well, right here, you're, you don't have to store the person. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's uh, back-end uh, application processing. Right. It's, right. it's more of just, okay, monitor it and tell me there's a problem. And APM or SAM provides you some more detail about the detail of the problem if you're monitoring that application. Which component is this? So this, yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I know all the different components. Yeah. Sometimes I lose track. So uh, it's called transactions here, but it's a synthetic and user monitor. It's a... It's very similar to IPSLA, but on the application level. So okay. IPSLA is running these continuous tests, storing the data, storing the results. So how is that different than APM? So APM is actually monitoring processes. It's monitoring um, the actual application and template, create application template to monitor key metrics on the server itself. Okay. And then this is actually doing more detailed run-throughs of, all right, this web application okay. should be able to respond within 10 milliseconds. And then APM can do basic web monitoring. We can say load the load this web page and it loads the web page. You can see but you can't this, interact with it. You can see how this gets confusing for your customers, right? Yes, absolutely. Because I mean, it, it's like when somebody asks me in the sushi menu, you know, it's front back. I, I mean, it's a little wilding sometimes. Okay. Oh no, I don't want that. You know, right. Yep. yep. Absolutely. So if somebody says, "I need to monitor a website," we say, "Go to this product." I need to manage servers. Go to server application manager product Sam. Networks. We start with NPM, and we kind of. I mean, again, but it sounds like if you really want a web server, you can do the APM with the. Some. 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 Yeah, that's what we'll call it. Yeah. yeah so. Yes, yeah, so you would want both, <clears throat> but depending on what, the, again, the conversation. Okay, well, are you monitoring it because you want to keep your SLAs up? You want to yeah. know what the user is experiencing when they go to your websites and see errors? Okay, you want to buy some. You want to know what's going on behind the scenes? You buy Sam. Well, I mean, okay. you want both. We want you both. <laughs> yeah, but again, it goes back to, yeah, the, to maybe you don't actually have access to the server. You can't even RDP or connect, and like okay. you're in a silo, and you can only monitor the web part. But you need something because you don't feel like it's being managed properly, and you need some way to measure it. And okay. so you say, okay, I can spin up my own VM and install uh, some on here, but I don't have access to actually connect to the server itself to get more detailed metrics okay. about the. Which we have. Okay. So I, I, I agree, and we, we're working on making that easier as well. So. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.